Hebrews 12, 1 through 13. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading from his word this morning. You may be seated. Well, officially, good morning. And my commendations to you, knowing that we're going to be talking about chastising chastisement again, and you showed up. So um, this is kind of like if there was ever a week that you said, well, you know, maybe it might be a good week to take off. This would be kind of that week. But we're into the encouragement side. So if there was a at least a, a thought process on it, last week was more of the exhortation and bad side. This week we get more to the, uh, hopefully, the, the edification and the encouragement side of things. And so we have been going through the book of Proverbs, and we've considered these um, the different topics, but we're into the pearls of wisdom, and as we've gone through the pearls of wisdom, um, we've moved into the chapter 3, and this will be the final one in chapter 3, and we'll kind of start sliding out of chapter 3 into the rest of the book of Proverbs. And the idea, the plan is that as we jump into a new topic, you know, then we just kind of camp on that and do the rest of them, and then we go on and find the next topic. But we've been, as we came into chapter 3, we saw then this that we are supposed to adorn ourselves, wrap around our neck, mercy and truth. And as we considered mercy and truth, we saw that it was chesed nemet. And that chesed nemet is that um, dual description that goes to Yahweh. Yahweh is he who is chesed nemet. He is faithful and true. And so in my mind, when I am told then to adorn myself with that chesed nemet, wrap it around my neck, it says, in order then that I might have what? Grace or favor. And the, I, again, the word there is chin, is the chin that comes from God. I am a favorite. You know about the Israelites and the Ammonites? I am a favorite. Okay? And if you know the grace of God, you are a favorite. How, how fun is that? My kids know, I mean, I have a lot of favorites. Anne is my favorite youngest daughter. Gabrielle is my favorite middle daughter. You know, I only have, what, one middle daughter, so it's easy to be the favorite, okay? And so Glenn is my favorite Glenn. You know, it doesn't make sense. And so, But God has a lot of what? Favorites. And as one of his favorites, make sense? You are rest secure in his chesed and emet. He is faithful and true. And because of that, you know that you can then 
trust him. He is trustworthy. And so you should be able to trust in Yahweh with all your heart, leaning not unto your own understanding, but to make him known, acknowledge him in all your ways. Well, what are the ways then? So that's where we started getting into. He gives us, Solomon then gives us two ways that we can reveal that we really are trusting him. The first way was honoring him with our our first fruits, our substance, our material substances, that we can honor him with that, trusting that he is going to then lead me in correct paths. He's going to lead me and guide me, and he's going to provide for me. The second one is where we got into last week, that in, by accepting his love. Now, that sounds great, because, again, we live in a culture that wants to buy our affection. You know, that you show someone you love them by buying them gifts. Okay, you try to buy their affection. That's not biblical. That's not biblical. You don't buy affection. You show by your commitment your affection. How did God prove to you that he loves you? Apart from this message. <laughs> okay, we'll come, to, we'll, we'll come up, bring ourselves up to this. How ultimately did God prove to you that he loved you? The ultimate pinnacle of the whole thing is he sent his son to die for us. That the most precious thing that the father had, he sacrificed for you and for me. That's mind-boggling. But even before that, I mean, no, I shouldn't say before that because honestly that was determined before the foundations of the world were laid, right? But so, so I get that. But then he made me in his image and likeness. He didn't have to do that. I could be like a dog or a cat. Make sense? I mean, I could. I, I mean, I could just exist on the earth. And then when I die, my, you know, it just goes away. I know, I hate to ruin that for some who or want all those in heaven. So if, I always look at it this way. If God feels like it's important for you when you get there to have your dog or your cat in heaven, your dog or your cat will be there. Make sense? Well, I think when you get there, guess what? It's not going to be important to you. So, but just think how many ways then he fearfully and wonderfully made me. He made me. Now, you may say, well, no, he could have done better than that. Anyways, but, but I believe God made me lovingly that he made me just as I am. And the quirks and everything else that may come with it, make sense, that build into who Bob is. But God expressed his great love for me in such a marvelous way, then that he died, then sent Jesus to die for me. But in that act, he, again, he could have just saved me, delivered me, and made me his slave. But he didn't make me just his slave. He made me his, his child. I have this adoption. I am a joint heir with Christ. That's mind-boggling to me. So with the territory of sonship, comes, say again, well, responsibility, yes, it does, chastening, that's exactly, chastening, we don't want to talk about that, but we're told that whom the Lord loves, he chastens, that chastening is the expression of Yahweh's love for me, that as we saw, and we'll look at it in just a moment, that if I am without chastening, if I am failing, if I am faltering, if I am sinning, if I'm walking in sin, and I am not being chastened, then I'm not his. I'm illegitimate. That's a hard thing. So, so as we come into this, and as we looked at last week, and, and we'll do a real quick review as we move on, I just want to encourage you that even if you're still struggling with this whole concept, that the spankings of God, this is what they is, is still an expression of his love. And if you withhold the rod from your child, we're told, you really don't love them. So my father loves me. And he has set, first of all, the prime example through Christ as we looked at last week, that Jesus himself bore 
my chastening. That's Isaiah 53, 5. That he was chastened for my sin, for my iniquities. But he did it for the joy that was set before him enduring the cross. Jesus knew that the end result of the chastening was the joy. Now, I want to read this again real quick. Uh, Chuck just read it. But I want you to, I want you to look at, there's a, um, a, a, a chiasm kind of thing going on here. You can see how it goes blue, red, green. Forget the purple for a moment, okay? That really could be green. I could have made that green. Green, red, blue. So it kind of comes in and then back out. Do you see it? Okay. So, again, I love to colorize things because it helps me to see things. Okay. So this is an encouragement, an exhortation to us. Let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily what? It snares us. Why do we get chastened? Because of our sins. Because we're sons, but because of the sin, right? That's why. So let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily snares us because God doesn't really want to what? Chasten us. Okay? Let us run with endurance. So let us lay it aside. So rather than let us have endurance. Looking unto Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. So I need to let set aside all these sins and the weight which so easily ensnares me by, by being able to bear up under hupomone, okay? And I can do that by looking to Jesus. So I come through that, talking about then how he despised the cross and everything. And again, now I'm reminded, coming back out of it, consider him. Focus on him. Who endured such hostility? Again, I'm trying to endure, right? So what do I do? Look to Jesus, and I need to consider him who endured such things so that I don't become weary and discouraged in my soul. So I can what? Bear up under it so that I can resist and strive against sin to bloodshed. Do you get it? Shh, comes in and out, okay? But what's the goal? For me to strive against sin. Sin. Pastor, I think I shared this last week. Years ago, I had a guy come in and say, Pastor, I'm struggling with sin. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm glad you're struggling. Too many people aren't struggling. They're really enjoying their sin. They're relishing in their sin. They're, they're, they're enjoying the whole moment. No, I'm supposed to strive against sin. I'm supposed to lay aside all this stuff. And when I don't, I force God to take on that fatherly prerogative and responsibility to bring a painful awareness to my dear ear, if you would, that something needs to change. Does that make sense? That really is the purpose of chastening. It's instruction. It's discipline. It's training. And I want you to focus on that part of it as we look into it, because that's the whole idea, this, this training thing that's going to be going on. And so the exhortation then, which we saw in Proverbs 3, verse 11, that's where we start from, but we see it here in Hebrews as well, and that is, do not despise the chastening of Yahweh. All I can say is, that is really where the rubber meets the road. As a child, growing up. Okay, kids, this is for you. So, so 18 and below, if you're still in your, your dad's house, and I know, hopefully, when you're in that older age group, teenagers, it's not happening to you, but you're still getting some form of discipline from that perspective. How many of you love it when dad says, meet me in the basement? Now, I know you may not have the basement, but understand that was for me, meet me in the basement. Or meet me in another room, go behind the woodshed, whatever, or it's time for us to, to talk about some discipline moments. Do you love that? I mean, this isn't a bonding time with your dad. You know, you, you and your dad get to, to join physically together in some in some way, you know? No, I mean, none of us, none of us are like, whoa, yeah, this is, I'm going to disobey God or my dad again so that we have this bonding time. Now, sadly, sadly, I don't want to get distracted on this, but sadly, in a warped way, there are kids who grow up because that's the only time they get to see their dad. And they do grow up with a warped way of thinking in that they are trying to get their dad's attention. And so they do disobey. Does that make sense? You don't need to do that with God. You need to change the way you think. If you brought that baggage with you into... Now, understand. Look, my dad was a Marine sergeant. 
he was only in for a few years, but he still continued to keep the crew cut. I love my dad. Okay, but for many years, I respected my dad, and it was a hard thing for me to understand the difference between respect and love, affection. Okay, and I understand this man taped. Okay, but he and I have talked through this as well. But it was very hard. So when I came to Jesus, when I considered God, you always put him as your what? As your father. Make sense? So God was my what? My judge. He was my disciplinarian. That's who my dad was. Now, I know my dad loved me. I, I understand that. But as a kid, I wasn't getting that. It wasn't connecting with me. I saw dad as the guy who was going to put the board of education to the seat of my learning. Does that make sense? Okay. And so, and the one who was doing the rules and the regulations and stuff like that. And, and I, my Abba, I still, and again, this is going to sound charismatic, and please forgive me for this. I still remember the day that God gave me a daydream. It was nighttime, but I wasn't asleep. And I was struggling with it. And I was, John 17, verse 3, this is life eternal, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ. It was resonating with me, and I was trying to understand this thing. I was trying to grow it. And and I remember seeing God sitting on his throne. You guys remember the, the Transformers? You know, the things that transform? And there was God on his throne. And as I watched, it transformed into an easy chair. And he reached down and said, but I am your Abba. Come on my lap and let's read a good book together. Now, don't put it in your Bible. Makes sense. I'm, I'm not, but I'm. T- that's it was for Bob. Bob needed that at that moment, and that was transformational for Bob. He's not just the God of the universe. Who is distant from you? He puts within us the spirit of adoption, which cries out, "Abba, Daddy, Daddy." He's my daddy. But he is still the king of kings and the lord of lords, and he deserves all respect and praise. But he loves me. He loves me with an everlasting love. All I can tell you is that there's times when he hugs me, and I don't deserve it. There's times when he holds me when I'm kicking, and I don't deserve it. And there are times when he spanks me, and I do deserve it. And someone asked me about this this week, too. I, I believe that, I mean, the, the people don't want to hear a pastor talking about this kind of stuff. But I know that coming out of the previous church, I made bad decisions. I was part of the problem that caused there to be the, the split. Does it make sense? And I, I believe God chastens me. I'm, I'm okay with that. I feel bad for everybody else who got part of the process of it. Does it make sense? But you need to come to a point where... He's your Abba. He's your daddy. And he loves you. And he wants what is best for you. And in the tapestry of life, I believe that even though he was chastening me, there were other people who were also being dealt with at the same time. Does that make sense? Not for me to discern. That's between them and God. Does it make sense? Everybody has their own story. But God loved me with an everlasting love. And he says, I'm not willing to accept this. You, You have to grow as a leader. And that's okay. That's, that's all good. But we have to get to the point where then we don't despise or detest the chastening, but rather we embrace it, we accept it, and understand it for what it is. It's an expression of his love. Instead of being honest, whiny brats, Brought up in this culture, but I want, 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 I want. If Glenn did it, anyway, if Glenn did it, there would be half of us that would be laughing and half of us would be cringing. This half up here would be cringing. Anyways, <laughs> he's laughing, of course. He doesn't get it. But the reality is, we know, I know, as a parent, if I allow that <laughs> now, What's it going to be looking like when they're 16 years old? It's ugly, ain't it? Okay? To get to the point where I then, as a child of God, am not acting like that two-year-old. But we do. And I need to change the way 
I think. Because the encouragement is, Yahweh loves those whom he chastens. It's an expression of his love, and it's an evidence of our legitimacy. Because if I'm not receiving it, if I am walking in darkness, if I'm walking in darkness, 1 John chapter 1, if I'm walking in darkness, then I'm lying and I'm doing not the truth. If I say that I have fellowship with God, but I'm walking in darkness, it's not true. But if I start to walk in darkness, think about this. And God spanks me in some manner. Then what's it proving? I am in fellowship with God. I'm walking away from it, but God's not allowing me. Because God cannot deny himself. God is not going to walk away from the commitment that he made with me. Are you tracking with that? So, it's an evidence then of our legitimacy. Now, we get into this edification side, okay, which is where we kind of kind of quasi-ended last week. This edification side, because in this, um, we're told in verses 9 to 11 in Hebrews 12, these specific terms that we're going we're gonna to be looking at, okay? And I put them in the English, and then you can see how it kind of relates there in the Greek. And then also there's this different word, which looks like, oh, I understand that word. I can see that word there, right? And, uh, but let's read it, and so you can see where they play out up here in the, in the passage. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us. That's the paidutes, okay? They were trainers, discipliners. We have had fathers who became trainers or correctors, discipliners for us. And we paid them respect. Shall we not much more be readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live. For they indeed for a few days chastened Padeo us as it seemed best to them, For but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening, Padea, seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been given not so by it. What's gymnapso look like? Gymnasium. It's like the gymnasium, okay? It's, that's the idea of it. They've been trained, okay? It's been the, the concept. So when you think about going into the gym, right? Some of you have the, those subscriptions or whatever to the, to the gym, and you go in, and you go in there just to eat donuts, right? To become, no, you go to the gym for a reason. That's to do what? To exercise, to train, to discipline, if you would, your body. First Corinthians chapter 9, Paul says that he buffets, not buffets. I love to buffet my body. But same word, it looks the same, but you can either buffet your body or buffet your body. But he was talking about buffeting his body, not buffeting his body. And so he says he buffets his body to bring it into subjection. The illustration then is to us as individuals. So again, remember, go back all the way to Hebrews 12, verse 1, that I'm striving against what? Sin. Make sense? This is the whole concept that's here, okay? So God wants me to become partakers of his holiness. We'll look at that in a moment. And so in this whole package deal then of, of, of training me, it's kind of like the boxer, okay? And so the, so I'm getting ready to go into the ring with, with Cassius Clay or Muhammad Ali, whichever way you want to call him. And he floats like a butterfly in, and I don't want to be stung, Right? So what am I going to do? I'm going to learn to fight against the rope of dope. And on the, for some of you who aren't old enough, you're not. You're thinking, I don't even know who this is. But most of you said something, so you knew who it was. Okay. And so, so I'm I'm going to spend time. It's not like I'm going to wake up one day and say, Hey, man, I think I'm going to do this this bout with Muhammad Ali. That would not be a mo- good moment. I mean, I mean, actually, that would be a good moment. But it's the moment that I'm actually in the ring with Muhammad Ali that would not be a good moment. It wouldn't last long. But what am I going to do if I'm really fighting in that bout? George Foreman, Muhammad Ali, I don't know any of the new guys, okay? I'm going to spend a long time preparing, buffeting my praying. Did you say praying? (laughs) Yeah, amen, amen. God make me look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Anyways, um, (laughs) I I need a transformation, not just in the spirit. Anyways, but, but... But in a sense, I'm going to be preparing. I'm going to be working on things. It's going to be a whole package deal. It's not going to be just a matter I'm going to go start hitting a a, a bag that's hanging down. Make sense? We're going to have to work on my footwork. We're going to have to work on my thinking. We're going to have to work on my diet. It's a whole package deal. And God's going to take this whole package deal. That's the idea of this word paideia. Okay, as a trainer, as a discipline. 
in the gym, if you would. Does that make sense? And so, again, I think I shared last week with the spelling bees, um, with the uh, Scripps Howard spelling bees. We've been involved with those for many, many years. Um, their, the spelling book that they used to put out was called the, Marcia, Paideia. Paideia. That's that word. A well-rounded knowledge. Because as we talked about in Titus today, it's more applicational, practical, that you live this thing out. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1 says, knowledge blanks. Anybody know it? Knowledge puffs up. But blank edifies. Love. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. So, so I can learn a lot, but it's meaningless. I mean, I was like, I, I can go and I can eat a lot of spaghetti and I can eat a lot of steak and I can eat a lot of things and I can bulk my body up, but if I'm not doing anything with it, I look like a what? Say again? A couch potato? <laughs> yeah. I look like someone who's going to watch the, the, the fight on the TV, okay? And so, so the idea is I've got to go through this training. I've got to go through this edificational process, building me up. And that's the desire. And so, contrasted to human chastening, our human fathers, we paid them respect. They, indeed, for a few days, and I say a few days, well, it seemed like a long day, but it was really relatively few, that you actually were under your father's tutelage, right? Train up a child in the way he shall go, and when he is old, he'll not depart from it. That's the whole idea. You only got so many years, man. You got, you've got to, to, to discipline them during those years so that they can be self-disciplined later on, okay? But as it seemed what? Best to them. Now, I want you to think about that. That's kind of a rough thing. The reality is that our human fathers chastened us. How? As it seemed best to them. Okay, dads. How many of you dads are perfect? Put up your hand. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, Yeah, none of us are what? Perfect. Now, whether you like to admit it or not, then, that means that sometimes you make mistakes. Sometimes you blow it. You're older now, and you can testify that I never made a mistake growing up, right? Yeah, <laughs> oops, she's come. <laughs> ain't going to respond to that one. Anyways, and so reality is, I know, I know there's one specific time that we know between us that, that was a, a struggle, that we had to get right between us, am I right? Yeah, okay, because Bob Barbie blew it as a dad. Does it make sense? I can probably go to each one of my kids and, and, and pick a moment where I have blown it. Okay? But at that moment, Dad disciplined as he saw what? Right. Isn't it kind of cool that with God, I know that he has all perfect knowledge and all perfect wisdom, and he doesn't mess up. He makes no mistakes. We're going to end with Rejoice in the Lord again today. But rejoice in the Lord. He makes no mistakes. He makes no mistakes. So when he is disciplining me, when he is pruning me, when he does these things, I know, I ought to know, I need to know, I need to remember that God is doing it for my good. I need to fly. So the goal, or we can do this for three weeks, right? The goal of godly chastenings, then, is that I, first of all, might be a partaker of his holiness. Be holy even as he is holy. That's his desire. That's the goal. That's what I think, actually, Paul was talking about in Philippians chapter 3 when he says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high call of God in Christ Jesus. I think he's talking about perfection and holiness. He's saying, man, you're such a perfectionist. I'm not. I ought to be. But because my God is perfect, and Jesus said, be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. So be holy. Why? Because Dad's holy. Dad's holy. Abba's holy. And, and I want to be like, I want to be like Dad. I want to be like my Abba. Romans 12. It's going to take me doing what, though? Offering my body as a living sacrifice, which is my reasonable, reasonable act of Worship. Wow, that's like a really hard thing. No, it's really reasonable. He gave everything for me, 
So it's okay if I give everything for him. And so in my quiet time this morning, I was in the passage where Jesus is saying, if anybody wants to be his disciple, if anybody wants to come after him, he needs to deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. I mean, it's just, it's reasonable. This is a reasonable request. So secondly, that we might produce the peaceable fruit of righteousness. That when people look to us, they see the righteousness of Christ exuding out of us. Not our own. Not our own self-righteousness, but his righteousness. For 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin that we might become the righteousness of God. So, he who was positionally righteous became, became, at that moment, on the cross. I can't comprehend this. I mean, if he only became my sin, that's bad enough. But I'm looking around here, and I'm saying he comp- God compounded all your sin with my sin, and that's pretty ugly, right? So now take that and add that to everybody in the world. And now take that and compound it to everybody who's ever lived. And there's some pretty vile people out there. I mean, I'm, 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 <clears throat> I mean, I'm vile, but I ain't that vile. I mean, you know, I mean, you know. No, I'm vile. Does that make sense? But seriously, for, for we can look at some people and say what? But they're really vile. You know what Jesus died for them? In 1 John chapter 2 says, um, and we have a propitiation for our sins, but not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That when Jesus died, do you realize this? He became your ugliness. He became your sin. And he eradicated your sin on the cross. How cool is that? So that I then can yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Not mine, but his. His righteousness now, that God who began the good work in me will continue to perform it to the day of Christ, that now he is cleansing me from my unrighteousness and working through me and bringing out his righteousness that other people can observe my good works and glorify my Father who is in heaven. If you shine your light so people see you, it's still self-righteousness. But if you do what you do because God's working through you, then ultimately he's going to get the glory. Are you tracking with that? And sometimes when we get distracted and we start thinking about it for ourselves, and what does God have to do? Chasing us, spank us again. Wake us up, assuming that we are his children. But if he doesn't, and I'm living in my self-righteousness, then guess what? Go back to point B, right? Maybe I'm just not his. But the effect, I don't know why that played out. That worked out very well earlier today. Anyways, the effect of it is to seek to help one another. And that's where we come up to this is, therefore... Therefores are always there for a reason, right? Okay, It's always a consequence of what was stated before. So based upon all this stuff, striving against sin, being chastened by the Father, there's a reason for it, and that is ultimately, we then, back in verse 1, 2, and 3, right, looking at not being weary and being strengthened of ourselves, and if we do this and we understand this and we we work through this properly, then we can turn around and be used by God as a, godly effect in the life of other people that we can strengthen the weary and straighten the way so that other people we can help them through does this sound familiar to anybody like go back to the springtime from second corinthians chapter one why does god comfort us why does he encourage us and exhort us that we can do the same for others do you get it as i experience the loving, chastening, rebuking of the Lord, it gives me the ability to assist other people as they go through the same process. That I can strengthen the hands which hang down in the feeble, fainting knees. That I can then make straight paths for my feet so that 
Look what it says. So that what is lame may not be taken out of the way is really the idea. Okay? So that I am walking as an example to other people. So I ought to want my path to be straight so that those who are lame, if you would think spiritually, okay, who aren't necessarily as strong, okay, that they're not what? That they're not taken out of the way, but rather that they can be given greater health. Okay? But if, if, if I'm the blind leading the what? Blind is not a good thing. But God wants me to be strengthened. He wants me to walk in straight paths in order that I can turn around and I can do this for other people. So we need to be able to run with endurance lest we become weary and discouraged by looking into Jesus. And that's exactly then what I turn around to others, okay, and be able to help them in. But where I really want to get to is the, the how question. It's the last one of these points, okay, because yes, there still is one point. And remember, I told you there's what? Three points under it. Okay? And so the, that's the exposition. How does God bring correction into our lives? I don't know if you thought about that, but I like to ask that question. And that's really where the volume of the book of Proverbs on this is going to come in. Okay? That we looked at just two verses from Proverbs. Now we're getting ready to look at a bunch of them. Okay? Because there's a lot to be said in the book of Proverbs regarding chastening, musar, and regarding um, what God does for us. And so, first of all, it's through his word. So, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Now, as before I read that, okay, what I want to do, Steve, if you don't mind, um, let's hand out verses, okay? So, I'm going to try to do this so that Steve's not running back and forth. Uh, although, I did like to get not so part of it, though. You would be really trained, right? It would be really good to be good physical exercise. So, so let, he can do it. But let's kind of go down this way and come back because we have a lot of verses that we can... Um, actually hand out. And I got my wrong sheet. All right. So, you want to take one, Marsh? Sure she is. Okay, good. You got the big one. Proverbs 1, verses 2 to 9. You didn't see. You volunteered. You you were in the military, too. You should have learned that one. Okay? You guys want to take any? All right. Proverbs 4, verse 13. Okay, coming back this way. Aleah, you ready? You want one? Sure. I love it. Okay. You got Proverbs 5, verse 21 and 23. Okay? Okay. Elijah? Yep. 6.23, 6.23, okay? Tony, 8.33, okay? Yes? 10.17, and then 12, 1 and 2. There you go. I kept you to, to three rows. How good is that, huh? All right. So, but we start here in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof. Okay? That's one of our words there, okay? That God rebukes, Okay? And for correction, for instruction, anybody want to go guess what the word instruction there is? Paideia. Okay, that's our word. That's spankings. Okay, our chastenings. Okay, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be what? Complete. I love the word that's there, thoroughly equipped for a good work. But the idea is plero, is that it's like that cup. Again, I've shared it so many times. It's like the cup. How much liquids can you fit in the cup? to where it bubbles on the top. Not, 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 but if you put one more drop in, it kind of goes, okay? But because of hydrogen bonding, you kind of have that bubble over. That's what it means to be complete. Make sense? God wants us to be filled. Does that make sense? And so part of that process, part of these things that he does through the scriptures, is he what? He spanks us. He gives us reproofs, and he spanks us verbally, if you would, spiritually, from his word, okay? So now we're going to see some of that. So, Marcia, why don't you read Proverbs 1, 2 to 9. We looked at this um, a couple months ago when we actually started this whole process. To know wisdom and instruction, to discern the sayings of understanding, to receive instruction in wise behavior, righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the naive, to the youth, knowledge, and discretion. A wise man will hear an increase in learning, and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel to understand a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Indeed, they are a graceful wreath to your head and ornaments about your neck. Musar is in there four times. 
the whole idea of, of this book of Proverbs is for us to know wisdom and musar, chastening, to be able to receive chastening of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. Again, I like the word, instead of chastening, I like the word discipline, because it really is the idea. It's a positive and negative thing, okay? To receive this discipline. The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline, musar. My son, hear the discipline of your father. We'll talk about that in a moment, okay? Proverbs 4, verse 13. Firm hold of instruction. Do not let go. Keep her, for she is your life. Wow. So wisdom is, is, is who's being talked about here. And it tells us then to take firm hold of Musar, discipline, chastening. And so it equates Musar with Chokmah, with wisdom. And it says then, take firm hold of her because she is what? Your life. Yeah. I mean, chastening? Oh, life? It really is. Okay. All right. So the next one, uh, Proverbs 5, 21 to 20. Just do 21 through 23 and make it easier. Okay. For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. He dies for lack of discipline, and because of his great folly, he is led astray. Okay. So the ways of man are before the eyes of Yahweh. He ponders all of his paths. So God knows what? Everything about you. But then he says in verse 23, he shall die for lack of musar, chastening. In the greatness of his folly, he shall go astray. Again, goes back with what we just saw in Hebrews. That if you're not his child, God's not going to what? Chasten you. But if you are his child, he will chasten you through his word. Make sense? Otherwise, you'll die in your folly. Okay? Um, Proverbs 6, 23. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law a light. Reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Okay? So reproofs, tocha, um, is our Hebrew word there that goes together with that reproof from 2 Timothy 16. Okay? Elenkos. Um, and it says, so reproofs of chastisement or discipline. Reproofs of chastisement are the way of life. Again, I need to change the way I think. I need to understand that that negative side is actually a positive side. Okay? All right, Proverbs 8.33. Hear instruction and be wise, and do not disdain it. Hear, hear discipline. Hear musar. Be wise. Proverbs ten seventeen. Whoever heeds instruction is on the path to life, but he who rejects reproof leads others astray. Do you kind of hear a pattern going on here? Okay, whoever receives what? The chastening, the discipline, the musar. He's on a path of life. Okay, okay and in Proverbs 12, verse 1 and 2. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. A good man obtains favor from the Lord, but a man of evil devices he condemns. Okay, so a good man is going to receive favor from Yahweh, but a man of wicked intentions he will condemn. Well, what's the, what's the favor from Yahweh for a good man? Say again? You got, someone said it. Instruction. Verse 1. It's instruction. Yeah. So it says, whoever loves Musar loves knowledge, but he who hates it is stupid. Because a good man is going to get it. Make sense? And so, so if you're good, from whose perspective? God's. Exactly right. We, we just look at it from our perspective, you know? And so you talk to somebody when you knock on doors, and you're going to get to, how are you going to get to heaven? You know, well, I think I'm good enough. Wow, you're sad. I mean, it's, it's, you're not. You'll never be good enough. Right? But from the eyes of Christ, if I, I'm only good, if it's his righteousness that I'm living in, right? And so, again, if he loves me, then he's going to correct me. And so, whoever loves Musar, whoever loves the discipline or chastening, loves knowledge. But he who hates Tokacha, the rebuke, is stupid. And so I always told my kids, they, they know Proverbs 12.1, you know? And when we're having a struggle, I just tell them, go read Proverbs 12.1. You know, it's like, uh, but that's it. If you don't like when I'm giving you instruction, then the Bible says what? You're stupid. I'm not allowed to call you stupid, but God can. And that's what God says. God says you're stupid. If you won't listen, you're stupid. All right. Secondly, then, that leads us into through our parents, right? And so um, let's continue on going back. You ready? You willing to read one there? Zach? Okay, so Proverbs 13, 24. Nadia, you good? Proverbs 15, 5. 
Um, Katie, yes? Proverbs 22, 15. Joe, Proverbs, you good? Proverbs 23, 12 to 13. Okay. Rises, yes? Okay. Um, Proverbs 19, verse 18. Okay. Jill, yes or no? Okay. So 29, verse 15. Then Brian, 29, verse 17. Okay. All right. So through our parents, Ephesians 6, 4, primarily we're going to see that that, when we say through our parents, it's primarily through who? Dad. Why? Because God is our what? Our Abba. Do you get it? And so that pattern is brought down into the human relationships. Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the paideia and nuthesia of the Lord, in the training, the instruction, the chastening, and the admonition, the nuthesia. So nuthesia is the nuos of the mind. And so the training of the mind, okay? And so the paideia is, is just your instruction and discipline as a whole, so it's spiritual, because it's of the Lord. Make sense? But then you have this concept of the mind that, that's going on as well, of correcting their thinking. So you're correcting their, their patterns, but you're also correcting their thinking. Okay? So both of those things come in play. And we see a lot of that in Proverbs. So let's speak to Proverbs 13, 24, Zach. you got to eat the mic. Okay. Can you hear me? He who spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. Okay, we saw that one last week as well. Spares his rod, hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines and musars him promptly. Okay, 15.5. A fool despises his father's instructions, but he who receives correction is prudent. That goes along with 12.1, doesn't it? A fool despises his father's musar. Proverbs 22, verse 15. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but a rod of discipline will drive it far from him. Hmm. This doesn't go well with Dr. Spock. And so, um, and, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm joking, but I'm not. I mean, really, you got to make a decision. Do you believe human psychology or do you believe godly wisdom? Okay? And so I think that's a problem. We're, we're seeing in our world today a generation from permissive parenting. Make sense? I'm just telling you. This is, I'm not making this up. This isn't Bob's course on, on, on child rearing. This is, this is God's. Okay? Proverbs 23, 12 and 13. Apply your heart to discipline and your ears to the words of knowledge. Do not withhold correction from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. Now, are there people who abuse that? Sure they do. Okay. But done properly, God's saying, look, this is important. So twice in there, we have the word discipline or chastisement. It is the word musar. Apply your heart to musar. Do not withhold musar from a child. In order to, find, to give proper musar, if you would, discipline, chastisement, instruction to your children, what do you need to do? No, let's apply the rod. Listen to what it says. Verse 12, apply your heart to musar and your ears to word of knowledge. Do not withhold musar from a child. In order for me to give proper musar to my child, what do I need to do? Not just receive it, I need to apply my heart to musar. Does that make sense? Yes, but receive it and accept it myself. In other words, that's the problem. Sometimes we want to be able to train our kids when we haven't been trained ourselves. I mean, so when Marsha and I did child training classes, really the, the main the big part of the child training classes was training the parents. <laughs> that's exactly right. I mean, everybody wants to come in. What do I do? What do I got to do for this kid? Well, actually, you need to train yourself. I mean, and that's really the, you don't say that right off the bat. Makes sense because nobody really wants that. But that's really the problem. The problem with child training is that we aren't trained ourselves. You can't teach somebody else to do something that you haven't figured it out on your own first. Okay? So we keep going. Proverbs 19, verse 18. Discipline your son while there is hope and do not desire his death. Okay? This is the word yasar, um, not musar, but musar is literally. Um, yasar. It's with chastening is the idea. So this is the true word. Chasten, discipline your son while there is what? Hope. Which means that there may come a point where what? It is hopeless. Mm. Okay. Proverbs 29, verse 15. The rod and rebuke give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Mm. So again, is our word tokaka, rebuke. Okay. They give wisdom. Proverbs 29, verse 17. Brian? 
Correct your son, and he will give you rest. Yes, he will give delight to your soul. Musar, Desar, again, your son. So chasten him, correct him, discipline him, instruct him, and he will give you rest. Okay? Yeah. So, so God is going to bring Musar through his word, through our parents, and thirdly, through other people in circumstances. Now, how do you deal with that one? This is kind of, this is kind of a big thing. That is that God just uses what? Other things. I mean, have you, I don't know, maybe you've ever been there, but it's like you weren't planning this. Maybe somebody in Walmart says something and you're like, what? God says, yeah, dude, that's you. Makes sense? Or wherever it is and you're like, wow, this is just, I just got slayed here, you know? And it may be through an unbeliever who was rebuking you for no reason at all, and your instant reaction is going to be what? Well, how dare you do such a thing? But all of a sudden, God says, wake up, buddy. Listen to what he just said because, you know, what he just said was all you. Make sense? And so God uses other people, not just your dads, not just your parents, other people in other circumstances to rebuke you. I remember once a coffee mug dropping out of my hand, and I'll just leave it at that. But God used it. There was, there was something special about that coffee mug. But God used the breaking of that coffee mug to teach me a lesson. I'll just leave it at that. But it was something as simple as that. It was just, there was something about that coffee mug that I knew about. Makes sense? And God just kind of rebuked me on, on, on the spot of, at that moment. It was signs and wonders. Maybe I'm Jewish. I don't know. Anyways, but the point is that, but for me, I got the point. Makes sense? And you understand, those are just little things that are between you and God. That no one else may have understand. That's why I don't even need to explain anything more about it. Make sense? But for me, I still remember it. I still remember the moment. You know? God, you're righteous and you're just. You're right. I get it. Okay? So, Proverbs 15.31. Let's see where we're at. Tammy, do you want to grab one? Okay, Proverbs 15.31. Coming across. Abigail? Proverbs 13.18. Okay. Yes? Yes? Okay, uh, 9, verse 7 to 8, Proverbs 9, 7 to 8. Debbie, you got Proverbs 15, verse 12. Karen, Proverbs 15, verse 10. And then Chuck, even though you started us off with a reading, you get to end us off with a reading. Proverbs 24, verse 30 to 34. And I'm sorry to this side. You guys, you need to consider that the blessings of the curses. Okay. So, um, all right, so 1531 to 33. The ear that hears the rebukes of life will abide among the wise. He who disdains instruction despises his own soul, but he who heeds rebuke gets understanding. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. Okay, that one is up on the screen, and you can see it all the different, again, our words over the time that we've been discussing through this whole thing. How many are, are put together in this thing, okay? The ear that hears the rebukes, the totaka of life, of life, will abide among the wise. Wow, okay. So that means we're, we'll get to that point of who we hang out with later on when we get to that part of Proverbs. But he who walks the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. Well, that, that one who's hearing the rebukes will abide among the what? The wise. Make sense? Okay. He who disdains correction despises his own soul. So like if you're despising chastening, you're really despising yourself. Okay. That's what it's saying. So and then the rebuke, but he who heeds the rebuke gets understanding. Okay, and then you have the of wisdom. Proverbs 13, verse 18. Poverty and shame will come to him who disdains correction, but he who regards the rebuke will be honored. Okay, so again, poverty and shame will come to him who disdains correction, but he regards the rebuke. Now that doesn't say it's necessarily coming from who? Your parents. Or or from the word of God. But it is coming from God, ultimately. God's just using what? other people in other circumstances, to bring that to you. And if you regard it, you'll be honored. But if you don't regard it at the moment, badness is coming. Poverty, shame is coming as a result of that, okay? Proverbs 9, verse 7 and 8. He who corrects a scoffer gets shame for himself, and he who rebukes a wicked man only harms himself. Do not correct a scoffer, lest he hate you. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love you. Okay, what an incredible passage. You know, that if you correct Musar, well, it's actually Yisar, 
But anyways, a scoffer, you're going to get what? Shame for yourself. Because if you try to give chastening, discipline to someone who doesn't understand the ultimate purpose of it, how are they going to respond? Spewing all over you. Make sense? That's why he's called the scoffer. Make sense? Okay. It doesn't go well. Okay. But if you rebuke, if you correct, then a wise man, he will what? He'll thank you. He'll love you. That's exactly right. He'll understand the goodness of it. Okay. Proverbs 15, verse 12. A scoffer does not love one who reproves him. He will go out. He will not go to the wise. Good. Okay. He doesn't love one. The scoffer, again, doesn't love anybody who corrects him or reproves him. Okay. Proverbs 15, verse 10. Harsh discipline is for him who forsakes the way, and he who hates correction will die. I love sometimes when translators become interpreters. Why is this one harsh discipline? I mean, it's the same word, musar. They made an instruction every place else. Make sense? I mean, it's amazing when you, when you start looking at the Hebrew words behind things. But also in this one, they decided it's got to be what? Harsh discipline. Okay? But it's musar is for him who forsakes the way. Well, that's exactly what we saw in Hebrews chapter 12. The reality is that God has to spank us. And if you don't pay attention to spanking, if you're his child and you don't pay attention to spanking, what happens? It becomes worse. Now, I, we didn't look at Leviticus 26. I think it was Leviticus 26 um, was also a cha- the chapter that's there that actually goes through the, the levels of spankings that God was going to bring on to Israel. If, and if they don't listen, then I'm going to make it seven times worse. And if you still don't listen, I'm going to make it seven times worse. And if you still don't listen, I'm going to make it seven times worse. That's because he loves them. Because that's They were his son. And so it's the same thing. So with my kids, I mean... You disobeyed, therefore you deserve a spanking. But if you come up with a stiff neck and stubborn heart and you're fighting against me, what has to happen? We're back to it again. Does it make sense? And so we get it again. And then you come up with a stiff neck, stubborn heart. I'm not going to tell you which one of my kids it was, but for Marsha and I many years ago, and it, no, it wasn't you, so since I say it that way, I would go, oh, Gabrielle, because you would be the most likely candidate. Anyways, um, no, I'm messing <laughs> Um, but it wasn't her. It wasn't her. She's such a joy. Anyways, um, but for real, there was one. It was a, it was one of those moments where, I mean, I would have given up, but Marcia knew what really was the truth. She was there, and she just kept at it until finally there was a breaking of the heart. And, uh, and that was a heart. I mean, I probably would have given up. Make sense? But Marsha didn't. Now, she didn't get mean. Now, see, for me, that's probably why I would have given up because it would have probably just been escalating like nuclear war at that moment, you know? And, uh, like, you know, and people have been calling the cops and, you know, everything else. But for Marsha, it was just a, it was something that needed to be dealt with. And it was, we were just going to keep at it type thing. And I was like, man, I just can't. It was, and so, but again, God worked this thing out, okay? That, um, and so harsh discipline is for those who forsake the way. God will continue to do that with us because he, Loves us. Okay. Finally, Proverbs 24, verse 30 to 34. So li- I, this is a little bit longer one. Listen to this. I went by the field of the lazy man and by the vineyard of the man devoid of understanding. And there it was all overgrown with thorns. Its surface was covered with nettles. Its stone wall was broken down. When I saw it, I considered it well. I looked on it and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. So shall your poverty come like a prowler and your need like an armed man. He was just out for a walk. Is that what it says? I was just out taking a walk. I was just out taking a walk. And I walked past this house that was overrun. And the the vineyard was overrun. And God slapped me. What he says is, I looked on it and received musar. I received a chastisement. I received instruction. I received discipline at this moment. You know, it's a lot better if we can learn from other people's mistakes. The problem, yeah, the problem is that most of us don't. We got to learn it from our own seat of understanding. And we, we repeat them. Why? Because we think it's going to be different for us. Oh, that won't happen to me, I'm a little bit smarter 
than they are. My situation is just a little bit different. How wise it is to walk past the rundown house and the rundown fields and to receive instruction. Laziness is going to end up here. I need to not be lazy. Does it make sense? I'm not judging that guy. It has nothing to do with that guy. It has everything to do with who? Me. Because I can tend to be that guy. I can tend to be that sluggard. I can tend to to not want to take care of the nettles. And I need to look at it and say, you know what? If I don't take care of my nettles, my house is going to look like that house, spiritually speaking. And to be able then to look at what goes on in life. And again, this is what I'm talking about with the cup falling and different things where God just uses certain things to bring your attention to something. And do you believe, this goes back again to faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, change the way you think, right? Do you believe that God's going to communicate to you? If you believe that God will communicate with you, not just through his word, not just through the church, the teaching of the church, but if God's going to communicate to you through other people and God's going to communicate to you even through circumstances, that God's going to use through speaking to you through the Holy Spirit in various situations, if he's going to do that, you need to be open to that. You need to be ready to hear. But the problem is we're not really listening because we really don't believe he's going to talk. We can intellectually say he's, we believe he's going to talk, but then we live a different life. That must have been the pepperoni pizza. That's it. I need to stop eating gyros for lunch. Make sense? I mean, I know it sounds like a joke, and I am semi-joking with it, but we kind of do that with it. But when you know God's speaking, when you know God's speaking to you, whether through his word, through your parents, and yes, that even still happens as, as an adult, doesn't it? Or through other people and circumstances. What do you do with it? What do you do with it? How do you receive the chastening, the instruction, the correction of the Lord? Do you remember our word for despise? Do you remember what it was? The oligari? The oligoris? To think of as being just small. That's what it means to despise something. You think of it as being nothing. It's just... So you disdain it because it's not worth anything. You say, I wouldn't do that with God. But when God speaks to us and we just kind of put it aside and treat it like it's nothing, that's disdaining his instruction and his truth. So in the end, how do you view chastening? Do you view it as negative or positive? Do you fully understand its purpose? How important is reflecting the holiness and righteousness of God in your life to others in order that they would uh, be strengthened? Are you concerned then with how the actions and reactions of your life affect other people? And then is there a need to change the way you think and therefore change the way you act? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your goodness to us. Lord, help us to magnify you in all that we say and all that we do. Lord, help us to, to fully comprehend your great love for us that you love us with an everlasting love. And in that everlasting love, Lord, you, you will spank us. You'll chasten us spiritually. But, Lord, it'll bring, you'll bring it even in the physical realm. I know that. And, uh, and it's because you love me. And so I thank you for that. Lord, I pray that as an assembly, as a body, Lord, that we would desire to delight in you. And, Lord, that we would collectively also be mindful of how you may work that work in us. Wanting to bring forth your holiness and your righteousness in us and through us. So Lord, help us to be willing to listen to your movement as well. In Christ's name, amen.